teaching something once is learning 10 times. If you teach, you keep learning. I love teaching. Over the years, it helped me develop as a learner and taught me that no matter how good a teacher you think you are, you are always a student. It's not easy being a student. When the students enter a new course, they get overwhelmed with new words. New words, new terminology, new definitions, new concepts, new mechanisms, new formulae, new abbreviations, new technologies, words, 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 and words. So, if someone is not good with words, does it mean that they cannot learn? No. Words are not everything. Human brain is a miracle of nature. And the human beings have tremendous abilities. And words is only one of them. The human mental abilities are called primary mental abilities. And one of the most important ones is intelligence with words. Word intelligence includes verbal comprehension and verbal fluency. Verbal comprehension is the ability to know the words and understand their meaning. Whereas, verbal fluency is the ability to use the words fluently. So this is verbal intelligence. The second important ability of the human brain is the mathematical or numerical ability. Which means, sorry, everyone knows what it is. Everyone faced maths during school days, right? I need not make it more difficult by trying to explain it. And the third important ability of the human brain is, of course, memory capacity. It's the capacity to memorize, recollect, recall, and reproduce the learned information. Our educational processes are mainly based on these three abilities. Words, numbers, and memory. And I like to call these three as the big three, as you can see them on the screen. And it's interesting to know that the big three are mainly influenced by the left side of the brain. Our examinations mainly emphasize on the big threes. And therefore, I hope you remember those days when we, had, we found something difficult, we would just leave it to mugging it up like a parrot without understanding, just because one must know it for exams. Oh, that's too much burden on memory capacity. I hope you started realizing now why examinations are always considered difficult. Complexity of words, twisting of words, difficult math exercises, time limit, and remembering, remembering, and remembering. That is what exams are all about. This is how the big three, they start bombarding and they start focusing on the learners. This is how the big three which are supposed to be our human strengths, they themselves start becoming the first barriers in learning. Because words are so easy to come by, our education system uses words as the most common or primary medium of information transfer. It means the students get bombarded with the words, the students get bombarded with the big three. But why? Just because using words is convenient for teachers? And then what about the students? When I tried to research into the verbal intelligence of medical students, I had some important findings, some remarkable findings. As far as word intelligence was concerned, the medical students were 37% poor, 37% just average, and only 26% were good at using the words in verbal intelligence. So this is the left side of the brain. And then what's there on the right side of the brain? Well, whatever is left. Rather, whatever is not left. The right side of the brain has three important primary mental abilities. And I like to call them the smart three. The first of them is called the visual spatial ability. It is the capacity to understand the facts and processes with the help of drawings, pictures, diagrams, designs, 
and integrate the information. So that's the visual capacity. And when I went into researching the visual capacities of the medical students, I found something different and interesting. Only 6% were poor, 15% were average, and 79% of the students had good visual spatial abilities. It means 80% of the students, almost 80% of the students would respond positively to visual stimuli, which means that they were good at using the visual abilities or the SMART3. The second important ability of the human brain, of the right side of the brain, is perceptual speed. Perceptual speed is the speed of perception. Basically, is the speed of processing the information to understand the images, diagrams, pictures, numbers, or concept. So perceptual speed is basically how fast you are. And the third and the last important mental ability of the right brain is called inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is logical thought formation to understand and analyze and then apply your theories. The logical thought formation so that you can think of a specific case and from the specific case, slowly you can reach towards generalization. Inductive reasoning involves integration and interpretation of the information which is obtained by all the different abilities. So it's basically your personal view of the world based on your evidences and experiences. So we have uh, visual spatial abilities, perceptual speed, and inductive reasoning. The smart three of the right brain. And words, numbers, and memory. The big three of the left brain. So let's imagine if the left brain is a human being and it's a person and he wants to describe the beauty of his uh, girlfriend, then what would the left brain do? The left brain would probably say 100 words to describe her beauty and at the end finally say, I love you. And what about the right brain? What would the right brain do? The right brain would probably just look into her eyes and she would understand. But that really doesn't mean the left brain and the right brain are two different entities. They are present in, single, in a single body. They are not present in two different bodies. They are part of single brain. And one is supposed to use the left brain and right brain together so that the information which is obtained by the left brain can be interpreted by the right side of the brain. Which means one needs to use the left brain and the right brain simultaneously. But for the left brain to analyze, for the left brain to be helpful to analyze the abilities, the right brain capacities needs to be used. Let's now come to some discussion of the visuals in teaching. The right brain to complement the left brain, we must start using the right brain. And if we don't use the right brain, the whole burden of information falls on the left side of the brain. And then there is, a no, there is no way to analyze the words which are learned by the left brain and the burden just falls on the left brain without analysis and interpretation. Now let's come to the use of visuals in teaching. Whenever we discuss about visuals in teaching, everyone thinks of presentation. So this question, using a presentation, does it really mean that you are invoking visual abilities from the students? Let's have an example. I have a classic side slide for you. The words, the sentences, and the paragraphs from the textbook are copy-pasted on a PowerPoint slide. It really does not mean they are, you are invoking any visual abilities in the students. Another question. Using a presentation, is it really necessary to invoke the visual abilities? Let's have an example from a subject called anatomy, which is study of structures. And in anatomy, the movements of the forearm they are described by the terms pronation and supination. I hope you are able to see me. This is pronation and this is supination. But instead of saying this, if I say, the king pronates and the beggar supinates, you will not forget this throughout your life. 
my anatomy teacher told me this 37 years ago and i hope you would also remember the king pronates and the beggar supinates a classic example of use of visual abilities to explore the meaning of the words this can be done by exploring the visual abilities effectively my research on the smart trees of medical students told me that 75% of them had very good very good smart trees they had very good abilities to use the smart trees so despite the presence of good smart trees in students our examination patterns and our teaching methods are obsessed by the use of big trees when i realized this i said to myself oh these big trees they have started bullying the smart trees it's enough now it's time to innovate and then a totally new curriculum in pharmacology was designed to explore the primary mental abilities of medical students let's call them pma that's primary mental ability based curriculum what we did was one whole batch of students was taught by traditional methods and another batch was taught by the pma based methods and the pma based methods they made use of various visuals diagrams pictures graphs curves actual medicinal formulations like tablets ampules capsules etc the boxes of medicines which are lying at home the case studies and the sound alike and spell alike exercises to remember the difficult drug names and then we compared between the two groups we found that the effects of the primary mental ability that's pma based methods were amazing the student perceptions for the pma based methods they showed us that they had active learning they had much improved learning environment and they have a, an improved learning attitude not only this they also had a sense of curiosity and they also had a sense of discovery not only regarding perceptions but as far as the examination grades are concerned we found that the students who learned by the pma based method learning pma based methods methods of teaching they scored better on examinations and their grades were the in, the improvement in the grades was statistically significant what does this really mean does this really mean that we should stop using words and just put up diagrams and pictures all over no there is a reason the smart trees are called smart because while the big trees are senselessly running around gathering information the smart trees are seriously and meticulously involved in integration analysis interpretation and processing of the learned information they are the organizers the planners the designers the thinkers the policy makers and the analysts of the human brain the big 3 are helpless without the smart 3 when the big 3 gather something what is gathered by the big 3 is called as information and when the smart trees give their midas touch to this information then information no more just remains information information truly becomes knowledge so let's see if the pma based strategies can be helpful to students yes we had an important innovation say for example some students they fear of viva and the oral examinations so what we did was we developed a strategy called self talk and this strategy was based on the strat based on the proposal which was given by albert bandura which is called as social learning model let's see what we did a student comes for viva he picks up a chit and gets a short topic written on the chit and the student gets 5 minutes time to think and recollect and organize the thoughts regarding this topic in his mind the most important thing is the student starts speaking as if talking to self so we gave it a name self talk important thing is the teacher does not sit in front of the student the teacher sits behind the student and passively hears whatever the student says the teacher neither asks any closed ended questions nor interrupts the students the self talk strategies proved to be of immense help to many students 
to get over their exam phobia and their performance is actually improved on the subsequent and the final examination. Because the self-talk minimizes the fear of directly facing a person and allows a person to calm down from anxiety. But this is not the crux of the problem which the teachers face. Although the self-talk is closely related to what is called as free association, which is used as a technique in psychoanalysis, the teachers are facing much bigger problems. A teacher's biggest worry is to bring interactivity into a long didactic session. Because the average concentration time of Indian student is found to be 20 minutes. I hope, now it really makes sense if you recall that the maximal permissible length of a TEDx talk is supposed to be 18 minutes. So, let's see if the PMA-based strategies can help and can they bring interactivity? Yes. We had an innovation on this. Suppose you have a didactic lecture session, then you decide and design to develop at least a couple of activities during this didactic session. And you develop a small group activity, quickly divide the students into small groups, and give them a puzzle or a problem or a concept. And then, it's free for all. You can use your mobile phones, your internet, your laptops, your textbooks. You can discuss amongst each other. You can share your opinions. And then finally, come to a conclusion. At the end of it, one of the students who is randomly chosen stands up and describes and gives the concept whatever their group found. This particular strategy facilitates the small group learning and the students learn actively and the students also have a sense of curiosity of searching the things and at the end they get a joy, they get a satisfaction that I discovered something. So that's about the use of the PMA based strategies, how to make the didactic lecture interactive. Whenever I think about my students, I'm always worried, I've been always worrying about my students who score less on examinations or who fail on examinations. And I'm curious to know and curious to search a reason why this is happening. When I started thinking of this issue based on the primary mental abilities, you will not believe I had an important finding. Most of the students who scored less on examinations or failed on examinations, they were less in verbal intelligence, mathematical intelligence and memory capacity. And what is our traditional remedy to improve their scores? Ask them to read, 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 write, 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 rewrite the exams, complete the assignments, complete the journals. So what do we really do? These are the ones who lag as far as the word capacity is concerned and the memory capacity is concerned. And we exactly try to throw on them the burden of words and memories. We have been enforcing, endorsing and bombarding the learners with the big threes. And honestly, it's time to stop now. Somewhere we are killing the innovators and inventors of tomorrow by focusing on the theories which we believe that they would need later in life. We are so used to this pattern of teaching and learning that we have started believing that this is education. We accept blindly and we propagate blindly. This has become tradition. Human brain is a miracle of nature. And the human beings have tremendous mental abilities. We are simply wasting many of them just by not using them. It's time now, it's time to move forward. Rather, to move rightward. And start thinking, how can we get over the big threes? is the time to move rightwards and start using the capacities of the right brain so that the right brain can start helping the left brain. It's really time for we teachers to search and innovate new methods which can facilitate the learning by the right brain so that the right brain potentiates the capacity of the left brain. When the right brain will start acting complementary to the left brain, that is when the education will really become an evolving and interesting phenomena rather than a traditional monotone. It's time for us to change now. Let's try to become untraditional. 
let's try to become untraditional and let's set a new tradition of being untraditional. Thank you.